yeah, cover that. Yes, that's the case. That's the case that I bet. I have to get the committee and the audience to calm down a little bit as we call the order. <laughs> 701. <laughs> Sorry, ladies. <laughs> Do you mean the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening. So we can start off tonight with our comments from the general public. Nobody's beating down the door. Though. Okay. So I guess we'll go right to the EAPC. Hello. Hello. And good evening, everyone. Good evening. Is that, can you hear me? Is that is good? Um, I just would like to begin by saying Happy New Year to everyone. Um, one of the things that I wanted to share, because this has been something that we, um, something that the teachers have been doing every year in the holiday time um, for at least a decade, um, going on two decades, it's a thing called the giving tray. And this is something I wanted to talk about because I think it actually kind of is a good background to explain the nature of a lot of educators. Um, Educators don't naturally like to brag a lot, and so it can be very uncomfortable. And on this giving tree, and in, 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 in light of some um, things that have been going on, and an understanding an educator and what they do. So this past um, December, there were 15 families that were sponsored by the educators of both the elementary school and the um, middle high school. These families um, represent about 40 to 50 children within the um, town of Carver. Um, <coughs> along with that, we work alongside with the police officers. The police <coughs> officers actually supported one of the families, um, as well as supplying multiple gifts to other children through, through working through the educator organizers. We also, we also had um, Zach Kane um, Foundation supported a family through a Zach Backpack, that backpack program, which was the first of its season, and it was a, a wonderful, amazing experience to actually have this. Um, the this foundation came and developed um, basically experiences for a family, like supporting um, th things like uh, gift certificates to. Uh, the the um, movie theater to restaurants, um, not to mention gift certificates to, for the families to help buy presents for their their family, and then gifts on the side. She the the family the Zach backpack ended up being a backpack with lots of presents, so it ended up being an incredible um, thing that was done through the community outreach. Um, there was also generous don donations made by some educators and some people that were. Um, I believe that may have worked in the school system prior. And at this season, we actually, we, we uh, the p organizers ask um, the families what it is that they want. It's an anonymous program. And so we have a list, and the list is created, <coughs> excuse, <coughs> excuse me, and honestly through, through the, um, the school system with the, basically the things that the children want where the teachers or paraprofessionals and support personnel can go and um, purchase these gifts and then c basically wrap them and then we, we um, organize a way for them to be picked up. The lists were um, completely done a week and a half before they were due and with the donation money we got to actually extend the amount of um, gifts that we got to give out this year, which is incredible. Um, with it's the amount it's this program just has a lots of support and every year seems just to grow that much more <coughs> um, lots of community connections so much email um, very moving uh, thoughts of appreciation um, and ironically I'm like I think this is an aw awesome opportunity platform to, to discuss this but the organizers of the program do not want to be named because <laughs> it's that nature of the program so that that goes back to where I think just educators, it's hard because that's something we, we grapple with. We want to do and give good, but you know, do well, but not for any kind of known credit for the, you know, for the, the fact of just, we don't do it for the, the photo op, let's just say. Mm -hmm. So um, I just wanted to ev let everyone know that that is something that happens within our town, and I look forward to this year. So thank you. 
Thank you. Thanks, Tammy. Thank you, Tim. Happy New Year. I'd like to say thank you for bringing that up too, Tim, because Scott and I were just talking about this a couple minutes ago, actually, that through the committee's request, we've asked for different presentations from employees, and they brought in what's happening in the classroom and what they're doing in school, and that's been really informative and I think good for us, but it's nice to hear that other side and those things that we don't get to see in here. So thank you for bringing that up. I appreciate it. <coughs> So I see no one from student council or captain's council. Okay, so st I have the st I have the student council update. Uh, so <laughs> Jenna Sweeney, Jenna, Jenna <laughs> uh, student council representative, is actually at, uh, she's on the gymnastics team, and there's gymnastics meet this evening, so she is there. Uh, she um, recruited a replacement for herself tonight, who also figured out today that he's at a track meet. Uh, so I know we have a lot of, <laughs> we, so we have events, so we have uh, some of our students at track meets, some of our students at uh, gymnastics, so we have some sports events going on, so I think that ha hampered cap Captain Scouts as well. But Jenna asked me to share uh, the Student Council update, which I said I would do. Uh, so representing Jenna Sweeney, uh, update from the Student Council. Uh, so the Student Council has been working for the past month on the Mask Excellence book. The Mask, which is the Massachusetts Association of Student Councils, executive book is in essence the council has to put together a representation of what they do during the year and then they can earn a diff different types of ratings. Uh, the highest point value you can receive is 46 um, and about, I believe above a 40 is a gold council. Uh, so for the past four years Carver High School Student Council has earned the gold council and for excellence title for the range of activities they do throughout the community. Um, so they're in the process of putting the book together right now which is just highlighting their community service projects, their school spirit events and other things that the council has been doing throughout the year with the goal of having them uh, earning that title of gold council again for the fifth consecutive year. Uh, they also wanted you to be aware that Student Council Secretary Brianna Lagerquist is going to be running for uh, the Mass Association of School uh, Council Secretary at the annual Spring Conference in March. Uh, so one of our one of our current members is going to try to run or, or win a statewide office, which is exciting. And congratulations to Brenner, and we wish her good luck. Uh, that conference, which is March 8th to 10th, there'll be a range of keynote speakers, workshops, a banquet, a spirit dance, uh, and there's actually student councils from all over the state. Uh, and we're, we wish better the best of luck, and hopefully she will become uh, the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Associated School uh, Student Council Secretary. Um, this week, uh, student council is going to be attending the winter conference uh, at Wareham High School for the winter sea mask. This conference is a night, <clears throat> and it's a roundtable meeting where we alternate groups and talk to different people from different schools uh, just to develop ideas of community service projects, school spirit activities. Uh, so it's a roundtable of the groups from southeastern Massachusetts that get together and just share the different things they're doing within their schools. Um, and then last piece they wanted you to be aware is Jenna, our representative, and then Brenna Larrick was again have actually also registered to attend the National Association of Student Councils Conference in June. Uh, historically we do not send representatives to the National Conference uh, but both of them are interested in doing that uh, and they've raised the funds to support them in doing that. Uh, so this, is a, this conference is an opportunity to meet different people from across the nation uh, and develop their leadership skills and also an opportunity for them uh, to get those same ideas and con concepts that they can bring back to Carver from the National Association. So we are excited that both Brenna Liger and Jenna Sweeney uh, will be attending the national conference uh, in June of this year. I'm sure Jenna will share a little bit about that uh, as she returns to us. So that's our, that's our student council uh, update. I do not have a captain's council update. Well done. So moving on to approval of minutes. <coughs> I'll make a motion to approve the uh, regular session and the executive session minutes for December 11th. Second. Motion made and seconded. Any questions, comments, changes? No? Um, Mr. O'Brien, can I ask for the motion just to be modified that we will approve the uh, executive session but not release Not to be released. Yes. Yeah. So, right? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, so let's break it up. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve the regular session minutes for December 11th. Second. So we'll, we'll strike that first motion then. Right. Okay. So motion made and seconded. No comments. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And then the and second. When's the release? On Doesn't need it. Okay. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve the executive session minutes for December 11th to be released at a later date. Mm -hmm. Not to be released at this time. 
second. Motion made and seconded. No questions, comments there. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Moving on. Okay. Um, reports from the superintendent. So our major presentation this evening is really around uh, a preliminary budget presentation for FY19. And Brad and I are going to break this into uh, two pieces. Uh, the first piece I'm going to take the lead on in terms of going through the concepts and looking at our educational blueprint, which we have laid out for ourselves as our mission and vision for the school district, and talk a little bit about what we feel like as, a, as, a, as, a, as an all team, as a leadership team, of services that we may need to expand over the next several years to carry out this mission. So my goal will be to do a little, little bit of a review of the educational blueprint for the committee and for the community, what some of our goals are as a school district, and then say what, what things do we really need to do uh, in terms of expanding or changing our services to have this mission come to life uh, over the next five years. Now there's a, really, there's a realization to that. There's a realization that um, you know, we're, we're probably not in the fiscal position to bring back all these, good, all these services and all the staff that I'm going to talk about at the beginning part of this presentation in the FY19 budget. But I think it's important to make a statement of these are things that do need to get built back over time. And we as a committee need to consider that and we as the Carver community need to consider that uh, as we go forward to say these are, these are things we need to, car to carry out our mission, to, have our, to really achieve what we lay out within the educational blueprint. So I'm going to take that first piece of the presentation. Scott, just a, a quick point on what you're saying, because uh, when, you, when you say the word expand, it almost sounds like you're trying to build upon, but it's more of a replacement of what was taken away. It, it's a mix. So some, there are pieces in here that are going to be bringing back pieces that have been eliminated or cut over the past years. There are pieces here where we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, the nature of education has changed and we just might need an expansion of services that we currently offer, but maybe they're not actually reductions from the past. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's a, it's a little bit of both. Okay. And what we did, um, how, we, how, we, how this presentation came about is over a couple meetings I met with the administrative leadership team, had them analyze and look at the educational blueprint and say, from your perspective, looking at your schools, looking at the district, what, <clears throat> what, are, what are places in which we need to grow to achieve the, the initiatives laid out in this plan? You know, so my goal this evening isn't necessarily to go through the plan word by word. It's really to, to tie it back to budget. But I'll do a general overview of the plan, then tie it back to some budget pieces that we think we need to, to build upon. Uh, and obviously, later on, uh, we'll come back with a kind of a report out on where we are on the educational blueprint. That'll probably be in the spring. Uh, in April and May, we'll do a, more, a much more formalized presentation of where are we on achieving each of these individual initiatives. So that's not necessarily the purpose tonight, but I, I feel like any time we look at a budget discussion, uh, we need to come back to what is our stated mission and goals. What's our, what's our vision? What's our big picture as a school district? What do we want to achieve? And how is budget related to that? Mm -hmm. um, and, but then also saying there's a, real, there's a reality piece too. Uh, you know, so in terms of the services we're talking about adding here, there would be some, maybe some significant expenses with that, which is the realization of maybe those aren't achievable within the FY19 budget. Um, but we want to put them out there that we'd like to see those things happen, hopefully in the next three to five years. Uh, then we'll go back and Brad will give us a, a, almost like a 10,000 foot view of, overview of where we are right now in terms of the FY19 budget. Um, and I guess I'll lay it out up front and maybe we can review it again at the end is kind of our thought process of how we're going to approach the budget season as a whole would be to give the 10,000 foot overview today, uh, see where we are in terms of services we're looking to have for next year and put that in relationship to what the town is currently proposing as our number for next year uh, and see what the difference is between those two things. Then we come back in our first meeting in February and our first meeting in February we have, there's still some questions in this budget, and some of those questions will be answered, and Brad will talk about that a little bit of how those questions might be answered. So the numbers, there's a chance that some of these numbers are going to change, modify a little bit. Uh, and so we'll come back in February, we'll make a presentation of, okay, so these things were question marks, now they're knowns, so we can put some hard numbers in the budget. And then also we might all, we'll come back with a presentation of, if we were to try to meet the town's number, this is what we would recommend as ways to meet the town's number, what reductions we'd have to make 
to meet the town's number. Then we'd come back and my, I'm gonna make a proposal tonight that we add a meeting at the end of February. Uh, and we did that last year. We had two meetings in February. And we have a meeting the fe after February vacation uh, that last week. And at that time, we'd have the formal budget hearing. And then the committee could make a determination uh, if they wanted to vote the budget number that night or if you wanted to prolong it into March and vote the budget number at our March meeting prior to town meeting in April. Uh, you know, so we, ha we have some opportunities there. So our thought process is kind of a 10,000 foot view with some question marks, but given us where we are right now in terms of relation to the town's number. <coughs> A tighter presentation beginning of February, maybe a little bit more detail. We've actually talked about specifically, we give some more detail around the special education budget and, and get into that number a little bit more. And you'll see that as we go through the presentation tonight, why we're gonna do that in February. Um, and then with, you know, what, what would have to happen for us to meet the town's number? What would we recommend the committee, what would we recommend to the committee to meet the town's number? Uh, and then come back at the end of February and the committee can make a decision on you know, what our next steps will be. And so there's some opportunity for, move, for some movement here in terms of where we are. So that's kind of the big picture of what's gonna happen this evening. Uh, any, any questions on that? Good. All right, so let's get into the uh, educational blueprint piece of it. And um, I'm not gonna, well, I, I'm like, hey, maybe I am going to read a part of this PowerPoint. <laughs> maybe I'm going to read some of these PowerPoint slides tonight. And we says it's never really our goal, but I think it's important. Just a general, general statement of what is the vision of what is the vision that the school committee has approved for the district. <clears throat> the Scott, the Carver School Committee is dedicated to continuous improvement and will collaborate to promote high standards to ensure all students become empowered learners and responsible citizens through a comprehensive curriculum that inspires students to learn and think creatively in a safe supportive and inclusive environment. Based on that, what are our core values? And as we, as we look at budget, I think as you look at budget, you have to look at core values. Um, what do we really stand for? What do we believe in? What do we want the Carver schools to be about? And these core value statements really should be an epitome of those ideas. And as we go into the budget season, you know, we have to look at all of these things but you know, obviously, we have to look at that third bullet. Decisions should be made in the best interest of students. And we, ha we have to look there, it has to be, in my mind, that has to be the most important one. And not saying the other core values are not important. Um, and, I, and I'm not gonna read them to you, they're up on the screen, you all have them in front of you, you can see them. Um, but I think that you know, over the next two months, as we start to make decisions about our district, about our community, about our budget, um, we have to come back to that third bullet of, are we making decisions that are in the best interest of students and doing everything we can um, within the community to support our students? Um, <coughs> under, this, under this blueprint, uh, we established four strategic objectives. Um, and these are the generic statements of what those objectives are. Um, number one, we want to support safe schools. And as I said, I'm not going to go through the whole blueprint itself. It's actually linked on there. And at the end, may, Meredith, after I go through the objectives, maybe we'll just pull it up for a second. But um, you know, the whole support safe schools isn't just about school safety from a physical standpoint. That's also from an emotional well-being standpoint of students. Uh, so that's a pretty con comprehensive idea. Uh, and the reality is, there's been a lot of discussion. It was actually the faculty, it was the focus of the faculty meeting at uh, the middle high school this afternoon. It was about social emotional learning and what are, what are we doing to support students who are struggling with social emotional issues? And we've talked about this a little bit as a committee. Uh, the reality is more and more students are facing anxiety, depression. You know, we don't, we don't have to go through all kinds of specific labels, but students are struggling more with social emotional issues for a variety of reasons. Um, and it's not, it's not even necessarily our responsibility to look at all those variety of reasons. It's the reality of those students are in our classrooms and what can we do to support teachers, administrators, guidance counselors, what can we do to support everyone to support those students? Um, so when we look at supporting safe schools, clearly physical safety is a priority, uh, but it also goes to the concept of emotional well-being and what are we doing to support the emotional well-being of our students. Um, engage the community. Um, so that's one of our strategic objectives. We do want to partner with Carver, the town of Carver, the community of Carver, the citizens of Carver, or the teachers of Carver, 
<laughs> you know, we want to we want to work with everybody, and and come together on achieving the best education we can for all of our students. Um, we want to enhance teaching and learning. And so obviously, a lot of what the school, a lot of we're doing as a school district, hopefully across the board, is that we're working on a consistently towards having everyone in the district do do their job a little bit better than they can do it. You know, so my goal is I, I need to be a better superintendent next year than I am this year. Uh, and we all have to take that attitude of we want to enhance our performance. Uh, and if, if everybody is working towards that concept of we want to enhance our performance improve a and, 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 and do a little bit better, uh, the reality is the, what that, what's that going to mean is that students are going to perform. Students are going to learn. Students students' performance is going to improve and the outcomes for students will be better. So a lot of our goals are around what can we do to enhance what's happening in our classrooms on a daily basis. And then a big piece for the community of Carver, and this is, this is you know, it's interesting. Uh, so you all know that I'm part of the new superintendents induction program and uh, I'm meeting with superintendents on a regular basis. We have a, we have what a, we have a group called the Lighthouse Superintendents and the Lighthouse Superintendents are the, all the superintendents pretty much on the South Shore, on the Lighthouse Schools, Duxbury, Cohasset, places that have lighthouses. Carver doesn't have a lighthouse, but we are part of the Lighthouse Superintendents. <laughs> Actually, I don't know, maybe, maybe there is a lighthouse someplace in Carver, I just don't know where it is. Um, but, you know, and then there's the South Shore superintendents, which is actually a little bit larger group, a municipal group. And, you know, I see different districts, uh, strategic improvement plan, we call it educational blueprint, whatever they happen to call it. And if you look at their, if you look at their, what's on their plans, you see a lot of commonality. You see support safe schools. You see engage the community. You see enhanced teaching and learning. Maybe not those exact words, but conceptually, same idea. I do think leveraging leadership policy and funding is a little bit different for us within the community of Carver. I haven't seen this on other plans. And I think part of our, our reality is there is right now, this community over the last few years has faced some budget tough times. We've talked about the concept of operating budgets maybe aren't funded fully the way they sh into the appropriate point where they should be. Uh, and, and the town's made some decisions in which we could argue, and I, I'm, not gonna, I'm trying not to go off on a whole tangent on this odd concept, but you know, we've made some decisions to support capital projects, which is a benefit for us. We have a beautiful brand new school going in. And I don't say, this, I don't say that as a negative. It's not intended as a negative for the audience. But, you know, and we've, we've done a capital project for the accelerator repair project at the middle high school for roof, boiler, doors, and windows. But all, and we've built a new fire station, and we're doing all these things. And there's discussion about building a new police station, which I support. And all, so, but it all comes with choices. It all comes with balancing. And so I think this whole objective is, what can we do as a committee? What can we do as an administrative leadership team? What can we do working with the teachers to try to leverage some of the, some of the concerns that we have budgetarily within the community of Carver to get all these things done, but then also a, a have an appropriate education for our students? And what decisions are we making to have the, those things happen? Uh, and, and I don't necessarily see that objective when I look at other people's plans. Because uh, I do think that's a little bit of a u uniqueness for us um, within Carver in terms of addressing all those issues and living, with, living within our budget but also doing everything we can to support our students. And that's a, that's a tough balance. And it's a tough balance that I've struggled with as a superintendent in my first few years. And, I, and hopefully, um, so hopefully what I'm not going to struggle with going forward, but I have a sense that maybe over the next few years we, we will. Um, so I think that's a, a little bit of a unique thing for us. Uh, so what we did is, and this isn't everything. Um, oh, sorry about it. Yeah, so I said, well, yeah, pull, yeah, why don't you pull up, you can pull up the plan for a minute. Um, <coughs> slowly. Uh, so we, we've actually created the plan as a, and under each of those objectives that's going through of support safe schools, engage the community, enhance teaching and learning, each school, each school has identified some specific initiatives. Like I said, my goal this evening isn't to go through those initiatives. Eventually, before the end of the year, we'll come back. I'll have Ms. Mrs. Holly, Mrs. Bastis, um, some of the administrative leadership team, give a more formalized presentation on what are we doing to achieve those initiatives and where are we. 
Okay? But I just wanted to put the document out there and let people see it. Uh, one thing we've done this year in terms of the educational blueprint is we've actually done, we've, we've done a hard copy uh, and we've actually given it to every office space, teacher's classroom. We've given a copy to everyone partly because we wanted to have teachers individually look at it and say, can I build some of my individual goals around this plan, which obviously that's going to help the plan come to fruition. But then also that constant reminder of these are the things we want to achieve. These are the things we always want to be working to. Uh, so this version of it is actually hangs in classrooms. You can see it uh, throughout the district. And we'll come back to the blueprint itself uh, and give a more formal presenta formalized presentation in the spring uh, in terms of where we are in terms of achieving some of those initiatives. So what we did as an administrative leadership team is we kind of went through and said, looking at these concepts, these objectives, what things might we need to do to have, or what, what are our needs budgetarily to carry out this mission? Uh, so under, and so, and this isn't everything. The, the list that was made by the administrative team was a little more detailed. But again, we wanted to have a big picture idea of seeing where we maybe need to grow. Uh, so our recommendations over the next three to five years is we'd like to see us grow in some of these areas. Uh, expand the FSP program, the Family Success Partnership Support Program, district-wide. Uh, remember last year we had actually had a presentation from our counselor. This is a program that we do in conjunction with Reed's Collaborative uh, that's providing counseling supports and actually a wide range of supports to families outside of the school day. Uh, Sarah Cochran is our counselor. She came and made a presentation in the spring. Um, and she actually, so we're still involved in this program. And, you know, so we have some families who are struggling with homelessness. We have some families that are struggling with uh, even having, putting food on the table. Uh, those types of things. We have some families that have struggled with some deaths in the family. Um, and she's actually going out and providing wraparound services outside the school day with the families in their homes. And under the program currently, we can support five families at a time. Uh, so as one family, you know, that's her maximum load for us. Uh, and obviously, as if one family feels like they've all their supports have put in place and they have now they're gaining other supports, she can move on to another family. So it's not a stagnant five; it changes throughout the year, but it's a max of five at a time. And the reality is, the the families we're seeing that need this level of support, and it's it's interesting. These are supports that sometimes we've offered in the past through our regular counselors, um, but the families just haven't accessed them for whatever those reasons happen to be. Uh, there be a variety of reasons of maybe why they're not accessing that service from our counselors during the school day. The reality of having someone that can go to their home at 6 o'clock at night sometimes just makes it more feasible. Who can provide in-home counseling, in-home services um, is just... It's, there's a lot of benefit to that. And as a reality, we're seeing uh, an increased need. We feel like we could, the district, based on the level of needs of our students, we could definitely support more than five families. But that's all we currently have in our budget. And that's all that's budgeted for next year. Um, and on that same ideas, uh, the elementary school uh, feels like, again, based on the number of students facing social emotional crisis, that they would they would, they would benefit tremendously from the addition of a school adjustment counselor, that they could use one additional school account adjustment counselor at that level. Um, also district-wide, uh, behavioral support specialist. Um, is, that's a position that was actually reduced uh, that we could, over time, that we could bring back. Uh, the adjustment counselor and the FSP were not past reductions. So those would be expansion of current services, where the behavioral support specialist would be a return of a support that was reduced. Uh, just in, and all, all those are around the concept of not physical safety of students, but social emotional safety of students. Uh, that we can do some more as a district uh, based on just the amount of the need we're seeing uh, for, for uh, students who are struggling with social emotional issues. Um, uh, enhancing teaching and learning. <coughs> um, strong feeling that we and I, we did not prioritize these so they're not these are not listed in a one two three four five order uh, we're not looking to prioritize any of these it's just the list um, is returning the kindergarten in Paris to full time so as part of our reductions last year we reduced the kindergarten in Paris to part time and we just feel like and it's in the need, it's in need and support of all of our kindergarten students to have uh, a full time power in our kindergarten classrooms um, Computer science teacher at the middle high school. Uh, that I don't know. I don't know how MES. I don't know what MES is, so I apologize for that. <coughs> so at the middle high school, we made the change. Thank you. 
Uh, you know, so obviously we cut, that was a reduction last year. We did cut our computer science teacher. Uh, we feel like they bring returning a computer science teacher full time to the middle high school is appropriate. Um, the reality is the, uh, the range of uh, technology services that our students require really calls for us to be looking to do some more innovative uh, programs for students. You know, the reality is it's, it's unusual for a middle high school to have no computer science programs. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a tremendous need to build back. Um, a technology integration specialist at the elementary school uh, where someone, and that's going more towards the idea of uh, having a specialist on board to work with teachers how to best integrate technology in their classrooms on a daily basis. Um, that would be a change in position, so that wasn't necessarily a position that was reduced in the past. Um, a reading intervention teacher at the elementary school, which is a pass reduction, uh, and the fifth grade teacher, which was a pass reduction at the elementary school. Um, and then going on to um, leveraging leadership policy and funding um, is increasing professional development items to support uh, universal design for learning and social emotional learning and technology integration for teachers. Um, we feel like the professional development has taken a little bit of a hit in our overall budget, so that is past budget reductions have reduced our professional development line item. Uh, we feel like we could increase our professional development line item and bring some more supports from students. We're also going to, there's also some concern uh, that over time that uh, Title IIA, which is a federal grant uh, to support professional development, there is discussion of that grant either being cut or reduced. Uh, that grant brings in significant money to our school district. Uh, if there was a major reduction in Title IIA funding, that would be a huge concern of ours. Uh, what's that? What was that Title II? I think it's 55,000. 60,000? No. Not it was 45,000. 45, yeah. okay. So that, that would be that would be a significant reduction for us if we lost Title IIA funding. Um, and there's definitely a concern um, that that is on the block uh, at the federal government level. Um, grade level lead teachers, uh, we feel like we, and I think we'd make a proposal to maybe, and this would have to obviously um, be a discussion with our teachers, um, maybe make a proposal of having that position look a little different, but bring back the grade level teachers uh, in, a, in a form because we feel like there's a value for that in terms of supporting all the teachers within the district and the administration. Uh, and then increase supports for PBIS programming district wide. As I said, this was not, this isn't everything that was necessary on our list, but it was, we wanted to kind of make that statement of, you know, the reality is this district has taken s some significant cuts over the last several years. Specifically, you know, last year we took a significant cut. It was one, close to $1.3 million, over $1.2 million in reductions. And eventually some of those things are going to have to come back to really support the level of services that we need within the district. Uh, so before we went into our formal FY19 budget presentation, we wanted to put those, some of those things out there and say, these things aren't in the budget presentation we're going to make next. Uh, these are just things saying these are needs that we feel like over time, next two to five years, we feel like we need to move in that direction and add these supports around social emotional learning, uh, around increasing some of our staff, around maybe using some of our funding a little bit differently. Uh, the only thing, there is a piece in here where within the regular budget presentation, and I, so just for a clarity point, we, we are looking to increase uh, our professional development budget line item by $20,000, uh, just out of concern that there might be that Title IIA cut, uh, and we want to at least start to address that, but we, we didn't fully address it. We didn't put the full 45000 in. Um, so that's kind of where, that's kind of our overall in terms of where we need to go in terms of carrying out our district-wide mission. Any questions or thoughts on, on this piece before we move on to the more formalized actual budget presentation? I'm actually surprised not to see anything about the restoration of an art and music teacher at the elementary school. I mean, we had an outpouring of, you know, uh, upheaval of, of, of the town. That was one of the biggest things people complained about. Mm -hmm. I'm actually surprised that nothing's in here. I mean, you, not saying it's I, again, not saying. Oh no, not saying that we wouldn't consider those. And this wasn't this wasn't the full list of every position. Right. Uh, but th this was. So when we looked at this. 
you know, so we've looked at enhanced. So obviously we weren't going to come back and say we need to add $1.2 million worth of teachers back into the budget for everything that we cut last year. Uh, so th we did do some prioritizing. So going back to that enhancing teaching and learning slide, and that's a legitimate question. As we as the administrative leadership team looked at it, we have prior, these are not, this is not a prioritized list of those positions, but in compared to other positions that were cut, yes, this would, these positions were put in as a priority over other positions. So the kindergarten Paris, the fifth grade teacher, the reading interventionist, mm -hmm. the possible addition of a technology integration specialist uh, were put in above the music or the art teacher. And obviously the community could have a different feeling about that and could clearly share that. Uh, I understand. I, yeah. I mean, I think it would be good to look at, I mean, especially when the new school opens, to see how much can the, the existing uh, music teachers can handle there and if well, the expansion could be Andy, beneficial. Andy, let, let's, um, let's let him go through the budget and see where we're at with the budget because I think to <coughs> Scott's point, there's already things that we that's this is a list of things that already oh. aren't included oh I know so what you're in, inferring right now is to add more to the list of things we can't include right now I'm just saying you know as every department goes through a wish list of things that in through the town this is kind of like a wish list yeah and I, mm -hmm. I, and I think absolutely and I think it's I think it's a very fair question to say um, you know in terms of sometimes in terms of public response there was definitely a public response around the reduction of the art uh, and the music teacher, and at the time, the at the time my presentation at the time was we did some comparison to the art and music services of other districts, and and I made the argument, which some people disagreed with, I made the argument at the time that the amount of services we were going to offer those courses was very similar to what was offered other elementary schools. Now, people could identify other individual elementary schools where the level of service was more, mm -hmm. but, but there were also elementary schools where the level of service that we're currently offering was consistent with what they were currently offering. Doesn't make it right or wrong, mm -hmm. but at the, it's, we always, I always want to go back and remind people, we did not eliminate art and music from the elementary school. Right. And sometimes I felt like that discussion became a little bit of a discussion of we eliminated art and music from the elementary school, which we did not. We reduced the amount of services of those courses. Uh, and but we did eliminate technology at the, mi at the middle high school. Um, we did eliminate a fifth grade teacher, uh, increased class sizes there. Um, you know, so none of these things were great choices. I, I, loved, I, loved, I would not be opposed to adding back a, a, an art or, an art or a music teacher. Um, and, but when we went back and looked at um, prioritizing these particular pieces, they, the elementary, el elementary leadership team put the kindergarten paras uh, the reading intervention teacher and the fifth grade teacher higher on the list than the art music teacher, well, but I think it's a legit, a very, very legitimate question. No, so I just, I just wanted to bring it up because we're talking, we're talking about the ten thousand foot view here, yeah, and um, I think we were pretty clear to people that that we didn't eliminate art and music from the elementary school, and we were in in parity with other towns mm -hmm. with services pro provided, but. Uh, as these are being listed, I think it's also fair to, to bring those positions back into the... Right, and right obviously well. we, we were reducing what we were offering because we were offering a really a high level of art and music. Right. Um, so kids were getting it on, a, you know, within that, within that cycle, within their art arts rotation, they were getting it, you know, some kids two or three times in the cycle, which was really, which is a great thing. Yeah. It's not, clearly not a bad thing. And the biggest issue for, of all these is that these aren't in the budget. So, I mean, this, we have to find the money anyway for any of those. So well, not only are they not in the budget, but as <coughs> we've discussed a lot, we're building a building that is set up for them. Right. So there are two art rooms and two music rooms and one teacher in each. Right. So the room, right, the rooms that will not be utilized, which I think is also a good point when we talk about that concept of levering, lever leveraging policy and funding, is right now we're building a new elementary school in which there will be an open art room, there will be an open music room, and there will be an open <laughs> fifth grade classroom based on the budget that we're presenting this evening. So the budget we're presenting this evening is not saying let's go to six fifth grade teachers, but there's going to be six fifth grade classrooms. So there'll be three empty rooms um, in that building based on the budget we're going to present this evening. Mm -hmm. And I, just to add to that, Andy, because I think not to dissuade the importance of that because I'm on board with you and I, I try to bring that up quite consistently about those empty rooms. 
Um, but we do, I think, even go beyond because uh, with two children in that were, went through the elementary system, w Mr. Howard does a fantastic job with the kids there, and that's something that a lot of districts don't have the opportunity with. And and Miss Chiokas has done a great job with the chorus. So beyond the regular general ed music, the the district still offers quite a bit of musical opportunities for students too. So I, I think the district does a great job doing that. I'm fully on board with you in filling those rooms up with who belongs in there, man. I'm not saying they didn't. Without either, a just, doubt. Yeah. You, no. You, no. No. I think, as I said, and I think it's a it's a point well taken to say. Um, should be on the list. Yeah, it should be on the list. Very fair. Thank. You. Any other? Well, then we'll shift over to. So what, what I will do a little preference for Brad, then I'll turn it over to Brad. Mm. So what we're actually proposing here for the FY19 budget, it's not a level service budget. It is a bit, of, it is bit, a bit beyond the level service budget. So we will identify the specific pieces that we're adding um, for what we're playing out tonight. Uh, some of those things are, there's just some requirements that as a district we need to meet, um, that we need to add those pieces. And then some of them are part of the reductions that we took from Pat last year that were saying, you know, those reductions are really limiting us in some ways. We need to add some pieces back. Some are also just costs that are tied to the new elementary school. Uh, so this is, this is a bit beyond a level service budget that's being presented this evening. Uh, second breath. All right, sorry, Brett. Uh, now, now I'll turn it over to you. He's going to let you do the interpretive dance. Yeah, no. we'll pass on that one. I'll leave that to you, Mary. All right, so day one of uh, FY19, here we go. So how we'll do this is similar to last year. I broke this down by deci function code. Uh, the 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, and 9,000 series. I'll go over them specifically as we go through them. So the first one is the 1,000 deci function code. That represents district-wide leadership and administration. Um, this includes all school committee and central office expenses, including tech salaries as well. No tech equipment, specifically just salaries. As you can see, we're actually requesting um, below a 1% increase on this line item. No major changes to uh, the 1,000 series. 2,000 is the Instructional Services series. This represents professional development, curriculum, technology, equipment, and licensing. Principals, teachers, guidance, all of those expenses. Um, the key increases in here is there's 26,000 for tech equipment. 10,000 of that is earmarked for the district-wide fixes that we mentioned before in terms of who's going to cover the cost for a projector and the um, in the um, electrical behind it, all those modifications, that's included in here. And 16 of it is represented from new computers for the middle high school, correct? Um, it's just desktop replacement schedules, and there's, I want to say, 400 um, in there, the 40, excuse me, 400 would be way too much. Um, 20,000 for district wide PD, as Scott mentioned, we're kind of fearful that um, Title IIA might get uh, cut out of the federal budget. Um, this doesn't fully cover that 45,000, but what this does do is right now we think we're going to have a small carryover amount from um, this current year's uh, Title IIA grant, so we'll be able to roll that over into next year, so it helps buffer it a little bit. Um, 15,000 is built in for Carter Elementary School. Um, supplies and materials, that was a riff of last year's budget, and same for 25000 for the middle high school. Um, supplies and materials, that's built back in. A .5 ESL teacher is built in here, and that's based on our, our shuffle of students moving from the elementary to the uh, middle school level. Step increases and longevity are added for all positions off current contracts. So there's no COLA in this budget at all. But any contract that we have in place, the step for each individual has been moved up. Um, and 30,000 is included in this for the teacher lane changes. Last year when we presented our budget in FY18, we really originally did not have that in the budget. Um, we moved over 30,000 from, going back in memory, I forget exactly what line item it was, but we had a significant savings in one of the line items that was able to transfer over to cover that. It came out to actually this year we had 25,000 in teacher lane change movement. Um, so 30,000 again is a fair estimate for going forward. 3,000 other services. Um, this includes transportation, 
health insurance, uh, excuse me, um, health for nursing and athletic expenses. Um, the major increases in here um, is a 4.76% increase. It's for homeless transportation, which right now is at 10,000. We want to bump that up to 20 because we've seen an increase um, in that, and Scott mentioned that in his um, presentation. And also spent contracted services for the routes we can provide. Um, that's projected to be at 140 right now. Um, again, these are a little bit higher than what we have on the books right now, but as you guys know, we can have a movement at any given time that eats that up. Um, so 140 in there. Here's one thing that I wanted to mention too. The $50 club user fee is not included as an offset. Um, that's something we can discuss as the budget's developed, but keeping in line with where we are in terms of last year, I wanted to compare an apples to apples budget, and that's, what I, that's why I um, took this off of that. But as we go through discussions and look at the budget more in depth, the future presentations, if the committee desires to add that back in, that's something we can clearly discuss. Brad, real fast, yeah. what is SPED contracted services at it's, currently? It's 120. 120? Yep. The 4,000 is the operations. This includes all utilities, buildings, and grounds expenses. Um, we're only at requesting a 3.26. The majority of that is based off the new building. Savings on supplies and natural gas and electric rates are actually gonna offset all of the increase that we're projecting for the Carver Elementary School electric bill. Um, until we go for a full year, we really don't know where that's gonna come out. But I think budgeting a $30,000 increase cost is a fair number. And it actually flatlines. There was no change in any of our utility bills between natural gas and electric between all buildings. It's going to flatline. Um, we did sign on to a 25% savings um, for the natural gas supply rate. So that's it's huge for the town and the school side. Um, and if it goes above overall, the overall number in between um, utility lines, we do have the utility reserve account set up. I forget the exact balance on it, but it's adequate to cover any extra that we have. Um, Increase to Carville Elementary School cleaning and supplies line and materials. We didn't put in a big buffer for any major um, fixes that for equipment or anything that needs to be touched at the elementary school because we're covering our one year warranty for the new building. Um, so there's really no need to jack that up. We can discuss that at um, future FY20 budgets. And we also included a $10,000 increase that for summer help, um, ceiling tiles, that is in the capital improvement plan. So for the middle high school, the corridors, the main, um, <coughs> main lobby areas, those will all be replaced. So I think in an effort to uh, help out our custodians, <coughs> adding on, I think it was 9,000 last year we spent for painting. We'll still have 9,000 earmarked for painting, but we'll also add 10 on to have uh, help with ceiling tiles in our budget. Can I ask a question, Brad? Yep, go ahead. Um, you mind? No, please. Um, through the operations, what's the reflection of the town-wide facilities um, plan that was put in place? Is there any savings for us on this, or was it a kind of a wash? Yeah, right now it's a wash. That's how we have a budget. We still actually both sides need to sit down, and we've had preliminary discussions on it. Um, but right now it's, it's actually a, a budgeted a little small increase for what we had for salaries for last year, but that's where we are right now. Okay. There's no shuffling of funds for what we had currently in our budget over to a town share, town expense line right now. No. I know it's relatively new. So. Yeah, exactly. And it still needs to work itself out with how we're going to go about doing all that. But right now, and for the next fiscal year, there's nothing proposed on that. Okay. 5000 is fixed charges. This includes retirement contributions, health insurance, life insurance, and um, all of our other optional insurances. Uh, $50,000 increase is to the Plymouth County Retirement Board. This actually levels out in future years. I think we have three years. Um, data of exactly how much it's gonna cost us. So we have one more big hit, which is the 50,000 just for the school side. Um, and the, after that, it kind of levels out. I think it's like a $2,000 increase or decrease um, going forward after that for FY20. There's a $30,000 increase to property liability, and this is based off the new elementary school building. And in terms of health insurance, we're actually seeing a $45,000 decrease based on new enrollment. That should be number, not percentage. Excuse me, I apologize for that. And right now I have budgeted a 10% rate increase. Um, again, estimate, I'll discuss that um, as we go forward. But it would have been probably, we're looking at, a, we would have a forty a $400,000 increase had we stayed on GIC1 and we had a 10% increase on health insurance. Um, so for this current fiscal year, to move to GIC3 actually helps us um, significantly. And actually, uh, I'm on that slide. This number actually also includes $80,000 <coughs> that the schools um, accountable for in terms of the mitigation fund as well. So that's included in this. The 9,000 series is the out-of-district um, programs. 
Um, this includes all special ed, vocational education, and collaborative education outside of the district. It includes all move-ins and increases in tuitions. Um, and for an example, I put, um, it was a $10,000 increase last year, which got approved in, I think, late June. Uh, for Pack Academy, went from $36,000 to $46,000. I know I mentioned that in a few meetings, um, but this will now impact our budget for FY19. Um, and this is a represent, uh, it's representing a 51.87% increase. Please be alarmed though that this, it, there's a lot of variables in this that we will discuss at our next meeting. Offsets have shuffled a little bit, so there's actually left less offsets coming off of that number. Um, I know this is an eye-opening percentage, but overall, um, we're actually kind of in line with where we are for FY18. A big part of it is the town picking up. This FY18 number doesn't include the town's portion picking up $200,000 from the special ed reserve account that we would have been liable for. It's, it's covered in FY18, but it's not in our budget until FY19 because that's how the funding mechanism is set up. So we will go in much more detail. Um, at our next meeting and Scott and, yeah and the only other piece I'd add, add on to is well we said I told you we were going to break this a little bit we'll break this down a little bit more because obviously you're going to see this is where it, there's a fairly significant increase and also part of that is we do have you know, which we, we have mentioned before at previous meetings uh, we do have two uh, new out of district students who've come in um, which are going to be cost shares for us next year uh, which were their full day tuition students that those two students themselves are going to cost the district around two hundred to two hundred twenty thousand um, dollars. So those, you know, that that's a reality in that piece as well. But we'll we'll break in you know, our February presentation. We'll break this number down a little bit more. Give a comparison of where we are in terms of number of out of district students. Um, that we're actually with the goal of really saying we're we're providing a tremendous number of programs within district. We're doing a great job of keeping students in district, and we've just had some unforeseen things happen to us that's going to increase this number a little bit. But we'll give a little more detail for the community on that number at that time. But like we said today, we just wanted to kind of give the big picture overview. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But to our operational cost standpoint, this is a 50, 51, 52 percent increase to our operational cost in terms of budgeting. So the next slide, this is the amounts above the level service budget that Scott mentioned. Um, again, it's the Carver Elementary supplies going up 15,000. It's the middle high school supplies going up 25. As much as this, this is above a level service budget, this is bringing it back to what level service was in FY17. Yep, and actually I say FY17 and it was reduced in FY17, so it's actually FY16 was the last time these were actually fully funded. Um, tech district wide fixes. Um, I mentioned the breakdown of the 26,000 of that after talking with um, the town administrator we think can be flexed to the capital line um, so that'll save our actual operational budget by 16,000. The district wide PD line of 20,000. Facilities line items related to Carver Elementary School, the new building, is 30,000. And the .5 ESL teacher is 50,000. And a recap of the offsets, I apologize, it's um, tight to see on there. But for grant 240 and 305, the amount is 650,000 that we're projecting to offset. For circuit breaker, it's 225,000. This is down from this current year's um, that we had 250 originally projected. We're actually gonna use right now 262 is on our books being used, but I'm thinking we're gonna actually have to eat into our reserve balance that we're trying to build up by another 100,000 to offset what we're currently responsible for for this fiscal year. Um, but again, we'll dive more into that in our next meeting. Tuition in is students who are tuition into one of our programs. We have, we're projecting right now 50,000. The pre-K fee, um, the number actually of enrollees went up significantly from what we originally projected. I think that number last year was 22,000 mm -hmm. was our projected write off. That we're gonna move up to 32,000. School choice, we're gonna write off 125,000. Athletics, we're projecting to take in 63, just over 63,000. Middle high school intramurals is going to be 10,000 again. And the parking fee is going to be 3,000. Um, as you see, the account offsets on the right, when I actually give you um, a copy of the overall budget, you can link where these are charged to and offset to right into the budget document. And as we had talked about in the fall, uh, we would we said we would not bring back a student activities fee in the proposed FY19 budget uh, So that is not listed here as an offset. We're not proposing to bring back a student activities fee 
that was part of when we took when we when the committee voted to not have that fee part of that that was the question at the time is would we look to bring these back in FY19 we said you know I said my goal would be to not do that um, obviously there was a lot of concern you know obvious not to get into each of the fees individually but mm -hmm. at the time there was a lot of concern specifically around that fee so we're not proposing to bring that back <coughs> so here's the recap so the <coughs> FY19 proposed budget is $23,729,261. Um, that's our school as presented tonight. The FY19 town budget recommendation is $23,259, or excuse me, $23,259,768. That leaves us a shortfall of roughly $470,000. Um, again, that's pending contract negotiations and how all those go. And if you look at the overall percentage increase, the town is proposing an overall increase to our budget of 2.15. The school as presented tonight is a 4.21% increase. And here we have our items still in play. Um, I apologize when we rolled this over from PowerPoint to um, Google Share, it did not really translate over well. Um, the health insurance rates. So right now I mentioned we have 10% in our estimate right now. Um, Early preliminary from Gateway Health Group has been 8%, very early preliminary. Um, we went through this exercise last year where we thought it was going to be 8% and ended up being, I think, 11 and 20 um, for each individual one. Um, so we're, hope, we're, hoping, we're, for eight, we're, we're hoping, hoping for 8%. Eight, we're hoping for 8 So if each percentage it comes down, it's roughly $30,000 of savings to our operational budget. Um, again, if that comes in at um, 8%, we're 60 grand to the better. And that, that's a number we'll have more formal. February is our is our agreement with the town on how we fund that. So by so February, if eight percent is what our preliminary number is, that's what we'll use. And we'll come back. So when we come back when we come back in February we'll have a solid number on that. Yep. Uh, revoke tuitions. Uh, <laughs> right now I have four students budgeted. <coughs> on our books right now, actually this number is is over twenty thousand. We have one graduating, um, so that this number actually is forty thousand in question mark. I have budgeted forty thousand over what is known for tuitions. But again, we won't know finalized numbers all the way up until the end of the school year um, before people commitments. And that's actually where that PD line was funded out of last year now that I remember correctly. We had on our books four students going to vocational schools. Only three ended up going last year. And we shuffled that money into offset the uh, teacher lane changes last year. So 40,000, that number should be for both tuitions. Um, again, and this could go down to the last day of the school year. So it's really, it's, once I get preliminary numbers, hopefully we only have three, and I can guarantee you we can take 20 off, but this is not something that we can totally hit for 40,000 until, uh, until I get better numbers. Out of district tuitions, we have 96,000 roughly on our books, and again, this is just me throwing out a number there, looking with Karen and Scott to see who do we have on our radar that we may be able to, that may be graduating, um, depending on how credits fall, and also who we may be able to bring back in district that's out of district right now. So 96,000 represents two flatter students to that academy. And and one of them is definitely a senior who's on track to graduate, you know. But we'll we don't want to. It's we'll 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 come we'll have a better knowledge of that in February as well. Yep. Of, of if that student's on finalized track to graduate, and then maybe we take them off the, yep. off the books. And the other option, um, which again I don't I don't know Scott how much detail we want to go into tonight, but tonight, uh, but is school choice expansion at the middle high school level. Um, that would bring in large influx of cash to offset our budget. Um, Again, that's up to the school committee to decide, but that's an item to look at. Yeah, so, so I think uh, I think we'll come back with a more solid recommendation in February. I think we've begun to lay the groundwork of having a discussion about opening up school choice to other grade levels beyond kindergarten. Um, you know, it is a revenue source. Uh, the reality is we're losing some kids to school choice. We want to we want to maintain those kids in the district, but also we might have an opportunity to bring some students in. You know, at the elementary level, uh, we probably don't have the space to bring students in um, for school choice beyond kindergarten. Uh, but at the middle high school level, we probably do have some opportunities there. Um, so it might have to be, you know, each school choice student is. $5,000. So if the committee decided to open up 20 slots at the middle school or middle high school, that would be the goal of bringing in a $100,000 offset, uh, which that $100,000 offset could be applied to our shortfall. Um, so I think it is something that the committee is really going to have to consider. Technically, we don't take that school choice vote, and I, I have to look at the, the procedure on that. Actually, uh, it's historically, it's done in May. Um, so we have to go look. I have to actually check with Desi in terms of time if it's required that it's done in May. Deadline is so we 
we might have to take a look at that and maybe the committee might have to make a, a decision um, to at least consider the concept of school choice. Um, so I'm putting that out there tonight. People can start thinking about it, ask questions about it, um, put it out to the community in terms of what questions would they have around bringing in some school choice students at the middle high school level. Uh, what grades would we want to do that at? Uh, what, what would we be looking at specifically? Because remember, we can establish all the, as with kindergarten, we can establish the criteria. We can say, you know, just, just throwing something out. We could say five students in grades six, seven, eight, and nine. We could say 29th graders. We could say, you know, so you, I, I think it makes sense to do it in transition years. Uh, you know, that's where you might get your biggest chance of getting someone going from, mm -hmm. oh, I don't, I'd like to have the opportunity to go to Carver High School in ninth grade. I'd like to have the opportunity to go to, you know, my, our school, middle school is, um, doesn't start till seventh grade, or our middle school starts in fifth grade, or, you know, so I think the transitionary years might be the, the years to look at um, versus your 10th, 11th seniors. Uh, but we can talk about that in a little more detail. And, but I think that might be a realistic option. It's something, something we've begun to lay the groundwork for, at least. You got to know very high level. Um, <coughs> <coughs> yeah, so clearly we can be far more detailed next month. We'll have two meetings to be able to talk about this before any kind of vote or discussion happens, right. and that could be even put off if we need to. But for now, are there any questions or, or anything that stands out to anybody that they'd like to ask before we move forward? I'd just say that the major slide would be slide eight, would be the out of district programs, and just really break that one down yeah, for us. Absolutely. I think if we are going to have a, a school choice discussion for the high school, maybe some statistics with that as far as mm -hmm. class sizes and numbers and all that yep. kind of thing. Absolutely. Yep. All right, seeing none then. Moving on to the school building report. Um, so the elementary school continues to move along on time and on budget. Uh, it's always impressive to see the building taking shape. Um, yeah, so actually on in the A wing, uh, the, which is the wing closest to the street, uh, that how they're doing the project is everything's happening in A wing, then B wing, then C wing. So A, a wing is the most advanced. Uh, if you go into the A wing, they actually have some flooring down now. Uh, so there's floors, there's cabinets, there's walls, there's, uh, it's beginning to look like a real classrooms. It's beginning to look like a real school. Uh, it's just always impressive to see how much work they're getting done over there. Uh, you know, really, we have, we've run into minimal, minimal problems over there, really not any. Uh, the project continues to move on time. Uh, the project continues to move uh, on budget. Um, our last mile, our latest, latest milestone is on last Friday. Uh, we finalized our technology budget. Uh, so the technology, uh, so we had a meeting that included Meredith and Stephen Mahoney and Ruby uh, and Brad and the technology consultants and the representatives from PMA. Uh, and we're ready to put our technology package out to bid. Um, and we actually, even on that piece, um, we, we've come in a pretty good place in terms of meeting uh, the budget of $1,200 per student, which gave us a total budget of $900,000 for technology within the new school. Um, and that $900 that MSBA funds actually, uh, that $1,200 per student that MSBA funds does not include pre-K. And we're also going to be providing technology for pre-K because uh, pre-K kids are going to be in the building. Um, so I think our number was around, our final number was around uh, the our final budget was around 960,000, uh, which if you actually include our pre-K enrollment is right on budget of the $1,200 per student. Um, and we didn't, we didn't cut things out to meet that number. Uh, it's just we made, we made some choices, we moved some things around that we wanted to do, uh, and got some pricing that put us in a place of being on that budget number. Now obviously that will all go out to bid and maybe it goes out to bid, it might even come in under that. Uh, so that was, that's kind of our most recent milestone on the project was uh, finalizing that technology piece to go out to bid. Um, our next piece will be finalizing the furniture. We've talked about the furniture a bit last time uh, and we'll be finalizing the furniture budget and that will be going out to bid soon as well. Um, and I don't know if the committee would like, I know I've been kind of giving generic updates, uh, but I think every now and then it's good to bring back uh, either Walter or Chad from PMA to kind of go through that monthly building project report, and that's something we can do in February if the committee would like, mm -hmm. kind of give that more detailed overview of where we are on the project. So, um, everybody, if we can put that in the notes, that'd be great. <coughs> uh, the next, next meeting that's coming up for 
the school building committee is actually tomorrow evening. So on Tuesday, January 9th, uh, we're going to continue planning for our end of year events and at the old school and our grand opening for the new school. So there's a subcommittee of the building committee uh, that's looking at grand opening uh, activities. Uh, and that group is going to meet tomorrow night at 6 o'clock um, at the central office for, for uh, the school district. Yeah. And J yeah, James is our representative on, on that committee. Yeah, and uh, there's a, the PTO is involved in that also. Scott, can you just maybe talk about because uh, it, it is starting to now become a reality of a possible crunch with <coughs> three <coughs> snow days under the belt already. Yes. That 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 window between when we have to be out of the building yeah, and so when we is, actually get out of the building is closing. That is becoming coming a concern, obviously. Um, ultimately, in terms of making decisions on whether we have school or don't have school, uh, student safety is going to be the ultimate concern. Uh, and that's going to be the decision maker. Um, <clears throat> but it does become a little bit of a tight time frame uh, in terms of when we have to turn the building over. Uh, so right now, we are scheduled to turn the building over uh, on uh, June 22nd. Uh, our, our last day of school was supposed to be June 14th. It's now June 19th. Uh, so we're getting getting closer and closer to that turnover date. Uh, so more snow days we have lead us closer to being there and having to move the turnover date. Uh, the impact of that would be, uh, you know, if we had to change the turnover date, it gives the contractor a little bit of an out to say, you know, we're not going to have the parking lot done for the opening of school. Where where they have a time crunch in this project, and we've been saying this all along. The time crunch isn't finishing the building. The building will be finished in June. The time crunch for the contractor, and they've acknowledged this right from the beginning of the project, the real time crunch is going to be raising. De raising, demolishing the two current buildings and getting down the parking lot in place so we can open up the new building. Uh, I mean, we can open the new building without a parking lot in place. It's not going to be a great thing. Uh, it's going to—it will lead to some headaches in the first couple of weeks of school, I'm sure. Uh, but I'm sure we can—I'm sure we can work our way around it. Uh, <coughs> part of that being, and we've already started to discuss, you know, what possible. I mean, I'm not going to go into the details of planning around that, mm -hmm. but I can, in essence, say at minimum, the current parking lot for the elementary school could stay in place. Um, but that's still kind of a long distance from the building, and you'd have to walk, <laughs> walk from there to the building. Uh, obviously, the goal is to have the real parking lot open. So the concern would be the more snow days we have, we if we do have to push the turnover date back, uh, doesn't mean the contractor won't have it done. Mm -hmm. It's just once you change the turnover date, where we're saying we we're going to give them the building, it gives them the opportunity to say, well, you gave us the building a week late, so now we don't have to meet this timeline of having everything done and ready for the opening of school. Mm -hmm. uh, so that obviously is a, a concern, but really a concern we can do nothing about, mm -hmm. uh, except for hope for not a lot of snow and hope we don't have a lot more snow days. And, uh, and, and you know, obviously saying this to the community again, uh, would never make a decision on not having school. Uh, student safety will be the priority in that decision, not whether or not uh, we have to move the turnover date of the building. I think when you look at this project as a whole, that that as a scope of worst case scenario isn't such a bad, yeah. isn't such a bad case really. Yeah, That's yeah. Something that will be managed. Yeah, and it, it, the the building will be done and completed, and if there's some parking issues at the very beginning of opening of school, we, we'll manage them. Ruby will do an outstanding job <laughs> and manage those things. It's like we've dealt with uh, parking has been a concern over there right now because we you think about what we lost at least a third of our parking mm. uh, for the project anyhow. So we've been managing that now for really over a year, more than a year, year and a half. Mm. Uh, so we'll, we'll work around whatever parking concerns we have in the first couple of weeks if we have any. <coughs> <coughs> and then the field project. I know we went pretty in depth about that last time. Yep. So we'll give a general overview of that where that stands as well. Uh, <coughs> so the field study committee continues to meet and plan the design for the track and field project. Um, the next meeting scheduled is actually a joint meeting of the Field Study Committee and the CPC, and that's this Wednesday, January 10th at 6 o'clock. I believe downstairs in meeting room 3, so that meeting is going to occur. Uh, the goal for the committee is to come up with a plan uh, to formally to present to the CPC uh, at their meeting on Thursday, January 25th, where they might decide to take some action on it. Obviously, I can't speak for the CPC and what they're going to do, but they, at that time, they can possibly decide to take some action and move forward with the project. Um, throughout this process, we've also talked about having a public hearing, uh, and we've kind of, 
uh, morph this together a little bit in terms of CPC through their process would also require a public hearing. So if they decide they're going to be involved in the funding of this project, um, we would hold a joint public hearing between the Field Study Committee and the CPC, which I think makes sense uh, to have um, the opportunity for the public to weigh in on the direction that we're going on in this project, ask questions about it, give input. Um, that has not been scheduled as of yet. So right now there is not a date for a public hearing. Um, the, pres our, the, the meetings that are scheduled are this Wednesday, January 10th, uh, joint meeting of the Field Study Committee and CPC, and then the, community, the CPC meeting on January 25th. Um, and you know the reality is uh, there may be some cost limitations uh, that may lead us to do some value engineering and reduce the scope of the project. Um, and, but that's a process we're going to be working through over over the next uh, month. Um, you know, Andrew is our representative uh, on that committee, so I don't know if you want to add any pieces to that or any thoughts. Uh, but that's kind of where we stand right now. Yeah, as we stand today, I mean we're at the tightening up the project and figuring out exactly what we're going to present. Um, and that's currently where we're at. I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of meetings in the next two months, and um, you know, I'm happy to represent. Any questions? So our, our, our last item there is upcoming events, and there's a sheet with a list of those. And I just have one request, Ruby, if you don't mind, on that list, um, Something I meant to bring up a while ago and I never did. On the 23rd at 1.50, there's an all-school assembly to send off Ms. DeMarsh. Could you, could you maybe explain what that is a little bit? Do want, yeah, do you want to talk about the World Marathon Challenge? Do you mind? I, I can as well. I, I, I can kind of do it together. Off spot. I, I, just, I meant to do this a long time ago when the letter came home, and, and I just, every meeting I've forgot I, to bring actually this Actually, that was part I, of the, uh, so we've touched, we touched a little bit of what happened at the uh, middle high school faculty meeting today, and at the elementary faculty meeting today, mm -hmm. uh, there was a presentation about the uh, World Marathon Challenge. Well, and I guess <laughs> that was my point, uh, to go along with, with what you did earlier. Sure. So I can pull up a little bit of what I shared today. <coughs> but, um, most of you know Mrs. DeMar, she actually presented at a, one of our, f our um, school committee meetings on the running trail, um, maybe a little over a year and a half ago mm -hmm. or so. So she and um, Tara Barboza had come over to present and talk a lot about the running trail and how successful it was. So um, Mrs. DeMarsh is one of two phys ed teachers at the elementary school. She's worked in the district for, geez, um, long time probably, probably about 22 years all right so she's um she's she just loves working with the kids and loves um you know doing extracurricular activities in the morning and after school she's also um been very focused on her own r running um she talked to scott and i a little over a year ago about a dream of hers that she's been wanting to fulfill um, and it's to run marathons so in 2015 the world marathon challenge was was started by I'm not sure the organization but it's seven marathons in seven days on the seven continents and Renee DeMarsh is going to she is going That's to do this awesome. on January 23rd at the Carver Elementary School we're going to have an all-school assembly with the kids and the teachers to send her off to just cheer her on and give her a lot of inspiration and motivation as she gets set to jet off to um, Antarctica is where the first race will take place so <clears throat> Um, Renee has been fundraising over the last year. She's done several fundraising, fundraising activities throughout sort of the South Coast. Um, she's raising funds for um, two projects, really. Um, Boys, um, Boys and Girls Club of America. And you can help me if I get some of the, uh, the Cape Cod Division. And um, also to raise funds for the, the Nature Trail but for the new school because uh, as part of the new school plan we only have part of that trail <coughs> that will be preserved and <coughs> part of the current trail which is a wooded area and then the rest will we're working on um, putting some probably some stone that that's part of the fundraising that Ren Renee is helping to to do so <coughs> um, again the world marathon tr challenge is also known as the 777 this year there are about 50 runners she told me today that will be participating in the in the race um, they as I mentioned they start in um, Antarctica and they'll end in North America 
and it's one rate, one run every day for seven days. So and they, and they go from the extremes of running in Antarctica in to the extremes of running in Dubai. Oh. Dubai. Yeah, so I've got the, I was able to pull this up. So on January 3rd, she's going to, January 30th, she's going to be running in Novo, Antarctica. On the 31st, Cape Town, South Africa. So they, they um, fly them to the start line. They, they get out, they run, they wait for all the runners, they board the plane, they go to the next um, continent. So on January 31st, it'll be Cape Town, South Africa. Then on February 1st, pull the list up on Perth, that. Australia. This one has Madrid. <coughs> um, <coughs> it's in that PowerPoint that I shared today. Oh, yeah, it goes right. instead of Madrid, it's Lisbon, yeah. but otherwise it's, it's the same. Yeah. Otherwise it's the same. Then on February 2nd, it's Dubai. No. Um, on February 2nd, it's Dubai. On February 3rd, Lisbon, Portugal. On February 4th, Cartagena, Colombia. And on February 5th, um, back home in Miami, Florida. Wow. Her daughter's going to be meeting her in Florida. And, and um, during this time, what we're going to do with the, the students is um, every morning when the students arrive and they go to the gym, we're going to share some pictures, hopefully, that Renee might be able to send to us or that we'll be able to compile and share with the kids, just have on a rolling presentation. And hopefully, if we'll, we'll get a clip or two, um, we'll share that with them as well. Um, then Mr. Elder, her colleague, um, phys ed teacher, will be having what we call team huddles during our specialist time for the kids once they arrive to the <coughs> special for the first 10 or 15 minutes. Talk a little bit about that continent that Renee has just been on or is about to be on. Talk about some of the, you know, the climate, some of the, the, the feats that they have to accomplish to get the race done. Talk about maybe the language, music, some things that are um, um, parts of the continent or that country. No, and <laughs> just try to make it educational, connect with, with Renee and really support her. We give her inspiration each day because you know she'll she'll need it. And we can certainly have her. She probably won't want to come for the February meeting because that's <laughs> right. At, that's right at the conclusion of the right. marathon. Uh, so we could do the Miami marathon and the uh, school committee meeting. Her feet will still be in ice. Maybe yeah. we'll have her uh, invite her for the March meeting because we'll also at that time it'd probably be good to give an overview on where we are in terms of yeah. uh, some funding okay. we've raised for the track, for the track, and where we are with that. Yeah. Yeah. January, yes. January 19th. Yeah, January 19th. Each one? Yes, yeah, no so she's very excited about this. She's been training for um, quite a long time. She's um, <clears throat> been doing a few talks. She was on one of the um, radio stations on the, co on the Cape Cod to share a little bit about the race. She shared the podcast with me a couple months ago. Um, they were very fascinated in her, in her diet because she eats a plant-based diet and talked a lot about the training. There's a, there's a little debate going on up here as to the <laughs> length of the races. Are they, is there a set? They're full marathons. <coughs> They're full marathons. She's, they are seven marathons in seven days. They're full wow. marathons. She's hard yeah. 24.6 every day. Every day. Wow. She's going to run just under 200 miles yeah. in one week. Yeah. Not to mention the jet. With the flight. Right? She, she yeah. said her biggest concern is the, not the cold weather because we've been in a cold climate. It's going to the, the heat. Dubai. Yeah. Yeah. Dubai. Dubai's, yeah. And a crank of the heat. Well, I think even the, even to point on that and, and what you're saying, and, and I, I've been meaning to bring this up for months, and she sent the letter home a while ago, but, uh, you know, to go on what Ms. Johnson said earlier, with the, I mean, she's living her dream while supporting local clubs and her own district and helping to do that. So, I mean, that's, that's fantastic, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's and, just very exciting <coughs> for her. She's very, you know, and she's, she's um, you know, she just sent an email to all the staff a little bit little over an hour ago just saying thank you and you know she's um, really appreciative of all that everyone has done to support her and and to send her off and um, you know it's just something that she is grateful to be at this point in her life where she can live this she's been talking about it and wanting to do it and she you know she did say you know I'm not someone who is is easily able to go up to the microphone and talk about these things. I just like to do it, you know, so.
kind of like Tommy was saying earlier, you know, she doesn't want a ton credit. of recognition. Yeah. She just wants to do it. To do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Ruby. You're welcome. I appreciate the explanation. My pleasure. Tell her good luck for us. You're welcome to come and join us at the assembly and send her off. Uh, that would be great. On the 23rd at 150. Thank you. What's that? Yeah, that's right. that's on that calendar. Oh, that, uh, Meredith, you want to go back to that? Uh, yeah. Go back to a fundraiser she's running on the 19th. Yeah. Andy was just asking a question about it. I don't know a lot of details, but I'll accept that. Mm -hmm. There it. Hold on, I'm going ahead. Sorry. So she is running a fundraiser uh, at the Garibaldi Club in Plymouth on January 19th, 7 o'clock. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe it's dinner and dancing and, and fun night out. Uh, that's a game. That's a game, yeah. That's a fun awesome. game. Thank you. Yeah, I played that. That's fun. That's a good game. Yeah. I think if I click by now, we'll find out. <laughs> but what, actually, it'd be twenty dollars. But it'd be beneficial if we just said what the website was. So what's what's the website, Meredith? Dreamrunforkids.com. And can I just? Add and you can make individual donations at that website. I just think the fact that she's modeling the health and wellness piece for kids is awesome. I think it's great. Mm -hmm. Health and wellness to the extreme. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know how to use health and wellness by yeah. that. It is awesome. Yeah. <coughs> So what, what part of that discussion is we've just given the committee a, a, a list of events coming up within the school district for the next two months for January and February. Uh, just so members are aware, obviously people are invited to attend and participate in any any of these upcoming events. Um, we'll let the to take a look at. I think that's, I think that's all we have. Seeing no recommendations from the superintendent, any reports from the school committee? No, I wish everybody a happy 2018. It's going to be an amazing year. Um, be a lot of exciting things happening in this town, um, and I'm just glad that we'll uh, we'll all do it together and we'll uh, make a lot of things happen this year, which is great. And I am absolutely blown away by that story. I, I <laughs> I'm really shocked. So that is just an amazing thing, and I will do my best to try to make that uh, kick off. So that was unreal. Next person, ladies. Happy New Year, everyone. Mm -hmm. Happy New Year. Happy New Year is right. All right, so seeing next month will be our big push and our big, our big in-depth meeting. I think we should try to move along, and I would accept a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to uh, head to executive session to conduct strategy in preparation for negotiation, collective bargaining with union personnel, and to not return. Second. Motion made and seconded. That would be a roll call vote. <coughs> What's that? Miss me. Aye. Aye. Miss me. Aye. Aye. All in favor? Unanimous. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.